All right. Hi, Finlay. It's so lovely to talk to you. Happy to happy to talk to you. Of course, of course. Uh, there's building work going outside my window, and um, it only started today. And I could nicely go out and ask them to stop because I'm speaking to the world famous Finlay Christie, but I doubt they would. So, <laughs> Do you know, what? It's, it's, I can't hear it at all. Thanks to um, thanks to the noise cancelling uh, features of of Skype. Which you were talking earlier before we recorded about how you feel old for using for messaging me on Facebook, but also using Skype, which is even that dates you even more. Well, what are you meant to use? Do you, have you, did you not hear of Zoom in the lockdown? Oh yeah, Zoom's okay, but like, oh Finley, it is embarrassing. But like, if I get, I I just can't do technology. Like, Zoom. Is there an option to invite people as guests on Zoom? Um, but I mean that the whole that's the whole thing, isn't it? You, I don't know. Cool. Fair enough. I don't, don't worry. I mean, what, what you go against Skype? Um, nothing. I've just I've thought people have moved on. No, not me. No. Yeah. And does your like phone? Does it have like a screen on it, or has it just got buttons? Can you actually like go on the internet on your phone? Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. You're so advanced. Yeah, I'll get there one day. <laughs> where where do you live that that you, that you haven't got a, a, a I mean phones with buttons you've got if you've got like a brick phone like a trap phone a drug yeah phone. the reason I like brick phones is because it means and I'm I'm not like a, a a hippie but I like that you just have space between your real life and when you choose to go online so I only have Facebook on my laptop so it's only when I go on my laptop that I can be on social media and I just yeah. feel like you know, with calls and stuff, it's like, like I I want to do them when I want to do them, as opposed to I'm just always available. I understand that. There's a yeah, that is that is quite nice. I I would feel, I get I guess that there must be an anxiety about, you know, about kind of who's trying to contact me that isn't able to that kind of passes eventually. Yeah, I I'm I'm probably not as popular as you either. And also I haven't built like my life around social media where you make an income and stuff off it. So it's probably mo way more in your interest. But I just think for me, it's like, it's good for my mental health, but it's also just, um, it's just good for my productivity as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, I get that. I'm, I'm trying to write a bit about that at the moment, how social media is, it's, it's bad for your mental health unless, you know, Unless you have loads of followers, then yeah. it's great. <laughs> I was going to say, you've done pretty well from social media. It, I've, I've been lucky enough to, to, to figure out what pleases the algorithm gods from time to time. There's there's always luck involved, but I, I, I think you know that you're talented. Like, you have done a really good job of, like, your impressions are spot on. And oh, people... But thank you. But that's, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't. I don't claim to be an impressionist at all. But thank you, Sam Campbell, comedian Sam Campbell, got me on stage at the Hackney Empire last week to do an impression of uh, of David Mitchell, and I was so embarrassed. I was so nervous for it, um, and I felt like I did a terrible job. But did people laugh? <laughs> people, <laughs> I think people people sort of clapped at the end as a kind of like. You know, just because they knew that it was over, and they were like, "Oh, this is probably yeah. the part where we clap." But relief. Yeah. <laughs> but so, like, when you do a uh, TikTok, where obviously there's that famous one where you are impersonating David Mitchell. So, how many takes would that take then? Do you know that's the quickest one I've ever done? That from from writing to putting it out, that's the quickest one I've ever done. That was just I was filming a different TikTok, and then I was like, I was like, oh, why don't I do the David Mitchell thing? Because I'd written this stand-up bit that, that that was like I was just like this is something that David Mitchell had done a panel show, and um, and then I, I I think it was like one or two takes and then put it out straight away and I did I honestly didn't think that anyone would get it, but uh, yeah, that was like the YouTube video that kind of made the rest of my YouTube videos pop off. So how long ago was that? Oh God, I that was in lockdown probably. So you've been six like so obviously you've been doing this for ages, but you're like mainstream maybe not quite mainstream but your success started in lockdown then I, yeah i i guess so it, it was uh yeah it, like, sort of towards the end of lockdown um i was living in a house with 15 people and um 
I, I think I was just bored and uh, yeah. couldn't really stand up. So I was like, oh, I'll make videos. And um, yeah, I had loads of time to do that back then. These days I've fallen off a little bit because, you know, stand up and everything else. But back then it was, uh, oh, I got into a real groove with it. But I mean, falling off, you haven't fallen off if you're now actually streamlining it into what you're really passionate about, which seems yeah. to be stand up. That's a good point. That's a good point. It, it, yeah, that's the... That's the yeah the, the the kind of exciting but scary part is is telling is going to tell people ah oh, but this is this is the thing I'm really passionate about and trying to get them interested in that as well. That's sick. I'm it's, I'm so chuffed for you. Like you. I was listening to um an interview like a week ago with Matt Reif when he was going on like oh I started so young I was only sixteen it's crazy but you have and it is crazy that he started at sixteen I I yeah. admire that a lot but like you started way before that. You've always been doing stand up, right? Well, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I started. There was a, there was like a thing called the Comedy Club for Kids, where they did, uh, they kind of taught kids how to do comedy. Uh, and I joined that when I was about seven or eight. I can't remember exactly, but I think I did my first gig around around seven or eight. Um, because I, my, my, I had like a overbearing mum who would push me to do all sorts of different stuff. I think, I, you know, she was like, oh, "We've got to find the thing that he's good at." Um, I wasn't good at like sports or chess club or anything. So, so, but I sort of, I was a bit kind of, I like drama and stuff. Yeah. And um, I really was, I liked comedians. My dad liked comedy, he put me onto like Steve Martin and people. So my first ever gig, I just did an impression of Steve Martin, put bunny ears on and, and I did loads of mime, but it was like the only thing I remember doing for the first time. I'm going, oh, I'm, I'm good at this. I mean, it was only yeah. seven. I hadn't tried that much. But then throughout the rest of my life, it was like, oh, yeah, that's still the only thing that you that you really, um, that and languages, the two things that I, I felt like I had a flair for. Like, um, so did you write those jokes that you did when you were seven? Or was it just like, these are jokes that are cool, so I'm reciting them? I wrote, well, I wrote them. I think I kind of, um, in the in the kind of workshops, for the Comedy Club for Kids, they help you come up with ideas, but then also you kind of improv stuff in the rehearsal. So I think I, I did this whole thing about banging into doors as I was walking up to the microphone and then opening the door and then banging into another door. Um, and then- And the, the crowd went wild. <laughs> Say again? And the crowd loved it. <laughs> yeah, well, they, I mean, they, I mean, back then when you're, when you're like just a cute little seven-year-old, you get away with anything really. I mean, I still bombed. I still used to do really badly at some shows, but um, yeah, I think my my first my first ever real bomb, I actually put it in OK Zuma. There's like a clip of me doing like new material off a piece of paper. Um, but yeah, I I I, um, I think there were like there was some writing exercise. There were like different writing exercises. There was one where you had to invent your own religion, as uh, and and something like that. And I remember just I liked I liked sort of writing and stuff and performing. So it, yeah, those that was kind of how you generated your material. And then, like, from the age of seven, I mean, obviously you weren't going, like, out three nights a week, but, like, from the age of seven, were you then just consistently, when you could, you were doing stand-up? Not at all. It was very it was very inconsistent. I'd do the, the workshops. The workshops were about once every month, maybe two months, but then the gigs, I probably did, like, two gigs a year or something when I was a kid and then, and then had a long break when I was doing exams. Um, but it was always something in the background that I knew I enjoyed. Um, I was with a comedian called Bobby Mayer recently, actually, who reminded me that when it, when it was lockdown, before I started making videos, I actually didn't think I was gonna do comedy at all. And I could, I'd completely forgotten that, but I, but I, was with, I was with Bobby Mayer at like, um, at some sort of, it was like a it was in a park with some like sort of party thing in a park and I was like I was like oh I don't know if I should I don't know if I want to do comedy and um and he, and he I remember him saying well you should do it because you can do it yeah and um yeah I don't I maybe if he hadn't said that I wouldn't still be doing it so is this your full-time job <laughs> I it's this it's this and um it's YouTube and stand up um, are like the two main, two main things. I mean, I'll still go back every now and again and freelance for my old job. 
um yeah the, I'm, I'm working towards those being the two only things but you've managed to build a life by like age 24 you're like your job is your dream job <sighs> yeah yeah I, I it's it's yeah, I mean, it's it, 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 that is it's also terrifying. Yeah, because when you make, I mean, I'm not, I, try, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but <laughs> when when your when your job is the thing that you love, uh, if the it feels way more high stakes, it feels like it never stops mm -hmm. because you don't. Well, I remember having the feeling of when of finishing an essay at uni. And that feeling of when of when you finish something that you didn't want to do, oh, it's amazing. It's such a good feeling. You and I've I haven't had that feeling since I started doing stand up because you never feel like you finish and you never feel like oh, I didn't want to do that, but I've got it done. Everything I do, I've it's something I have. You know, I've told myself, oh yeah, I'm doing this because I want to do it. I, I mean, I don't want to sound great. It's it's great, but it is it's it's stressful not to feel like, you know, there's, there's a kind of security of having it just as a hobby. Um, yeah, I think sometimes makes it kind of more enjoyable, but staking everything on it is, um, you know, this could it could all fall apart. Well, but then it so could a boring accountancy job. You know, what I mean, like a life that you don't like could fall apart as well. So, I mean, even if it does fall apart, you you've still got to enjoy this experience while it lasted. And for sure, oh, I'm mass massively enjoying it. Yeah, but like, I guess the other thing about once you do something you love full time is like once you reach your dream you also have to then live with the fact that it's not fun all the time and you never dreamt about those aspects either I suppose yeah exactly exactly yeah um it's for most of the time though See, that's great do you, yeah. are you good at like keeping a you say like you're working all the time but like are you good at like I'm going to work tomorrow from nine till six and then afterwards I won't look at my phone or I won't even if I think of something funny, I'm just gonna save it for tomorrow. Oh no, no, no! Yeah, it's 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 nonstop. I mean, when I'm with when I'm with my girlfriend or something, then I I'll stop, um, you know, doing work. But the yeah. rest of the time, yeah, everything, is, you know, because it, it'll, it'll be I'll be you know be an email about something or you know an Instagram about something or I'm you know some editing I have to do or I've got a gig that night or I'm just thinking about ideas and yeah it doesn't it, it it my whole life is comedy when I open my phone my whole Instagram is other comedians every yeah. conversation I have with my friends is about comedy <laughs> that's nice though I mean yeah. maybe not always seeing other comedians online because then there's the comparison aspect yeah for sure that, and that yeah that's terrifying it is a bit cutthroat comedy the, I mean my girlfriend she's not a comedian thank god I don't understand how people who uh, people who do comedy and their whole life is comedy all their friends are comedians have also comedian partners because that's the one area of, of my life I feel like is an escape from from comedy which I need every now and again even though I love it is she funny though she's hilarious she's way funnier than me she's 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 absolutely hilarious yeah but not in like a uh in, in I mean people I think way funnier than someone who can write a joke is just someone who's a good character I think yeah, someone, yeah. someone, someone, yeah, someone who's just funny naturally um, because everything that they say is very characteristic of them is way funnier than, than someone who can write a joke. I, I do stand up as a hobby, not to pursue it as a career, but because I'm really, I really like, what I really like is that something that people find so terrifying, I can do. I like the personal uh, development of it. But I feel when I tell people, Oh, I do stand up as a hobby. Like, I feel very fraudulent because I'm I'm almost always in a room where there's like four, like just objectively funnier people than me. But it's just the difference is is that like, I actually gave it a shot, unlike them. That's not having a go, just you know. But also yeah. that if you can, I think like a, a big part of the skill of stand up is actually just the skill of writing. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, you might be funny off stage, but taking it on stage is the the challenge. And, and yeah. I suppose, like, if you're good at languages, you're good at like um, composing a story and understanding things from different perspectives, and being linguistic with how you like compose a joke and stuff, right? Um, I don't know how much. I, I mean, I I don't know how much the languages feeds into. It. I'd be interested to know. I also grew up with a. 
a mum who was a, a literary agent who sort of edited edited people's book submissions for oh. for a living. So did that pay for the private school? That no, that was my dad. Oh, that was yeah. my, my dad worked in advertising. Okay. Uh, my mum, my mum, you know, her she's amazing at her job as well. But my dad was uh, uh, sort of advertising genius. Um, but yeah, the, the, she edited my grammar um, from a very young age, and I think I've, I've become obsessed with like everything needs to be as concise as possible. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Yeah. I, I, and did you has your dad helped you with advertising then? I'll ask his opinion on things like titles for things or um, I'm trying to think what else if you know like a poster or something I think both my parents have quite a good sense of like um, how to market something they, they met in an advertising job um, and they're always saying you know they they have they have kind of good ideas about how to catch people's attention um so yeah maybe part of that's helped with content and stuff as well mm. what you're what well, i was reading the comments of your okay zoomer and so many of the comments were saying like everyone loves him because he's he like a, appeals to such a wide demographic he's inoffensive etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, which I think I think that's true. Um, is that a is that a conscious choice, or is it just where your, your humor naturally takes you? Do you know that's interesting? So I don't I haven't read the comments on on the special, but um, not because but just purely because I think that they'll like this. You know, if I see a bad one, it'll just upset me. Yeah. Um. So. You know, I've 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 asked my friends like, are they mostly positive? And they've been like, yeah. And I've been like, okay, thank God, don't tell me anything else. But um, inoffensive is uh, is an interesting uh, thing to hear about it because there's certain jokes in there that I'm like that I that I've had people have very bad reactions to the private school stuff, you know, the Malala stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples that were in the first. I, I I've I've never really thought of myself as being inoffensive, and I don't I don't know if the next special they'll be able to say the same thing. Quite a lot of my stuff in the in the hour that I'm writing at the moment is a little more on the nose. Um, I guess in terms of appealing to a wide demographic, it's not something that I've tr tried to do. I just write what I find funny at that time, and I think my sense of humor changes year to year. So uh you know it's influenced by whatever comedy i'm consuming and find interesting what, what have people got uh, against your malala then? the malala stuff well first of all i'll do that in certain parts of the country and they'll be like this bit is not relatable at all we don't know anyone who's been to oxford or cambridge so you know why is this even, why are you moaning about not getting into oxford like but yeah this, you're not this, really this is a very working class community yeah i know but it can it can come across a certain way because of people's yeah people's perceptions the private school bit I've had people walk out you know I did that in Edinburgh and I had yeah three Scottish guys walk out uh yeah call me a Tory cunt and walk out but they all go to private school in Edinburgh so I don't get that oh these but, they uh, definitely work from Edinburgh these guys yeah. um, but also like um you're not really like the the joke is that you're making fun of yourself in that but I mean obviously I don't need to explain your own jokes to you but yeah, pe people in Britain, because we're so obsessed with class, some people definitely have a, a chip on their shoulder. I say that as like someone who comes from a totally like working class background myself, like it can, it's a, it's a, it's a sore subject, but I feel like you handled it in the tamest way possible. So. Oh, yeah. well that's, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I like to think that my stuff, I mean, I, I I do make an effort to make sure that even if I'm tackling a difficult subject, I'm not going to offend someone. Um, I think I really like tension in jokes, so I'll try to, you know, bring up Malala or private school or something that's going to make people think, "Oh, where's he going here?" Yeah. Um, and then you know, and then I like I like long pauses as well, so I, I'll build that tension and then let it kind of hang for a bit and then release it. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean otherwise otherwise comedy is not interesting uh appealing to a wide demographic though i think i think you kind of have to do that as well when you do stand up because you've got to make 
most of the people in the room laugh. Yeah, until you really build like a very specific audience, until then you you just have to make everyone laugh. I exactly. I find Frankie Boyle funny, but I've no idea how he made it because like even now when he like does goes to the stand in Glasgow and stuff, like like half the audience don't laugh, and that's one of the biggest <laughs> Scottish names you know, in Glasgow, like performing for them. Like, so yeah, he's just so aggressive. I mean, obviously it works for you once you're big, but I have no idea how it works when you're like really starting out and like you're yeah. in a room of five people. It's, it's self-belief. It's, yeah. it's belief that there's someone out there that finds this as funny as I do. Um, there's people like that where you go, you know, thank thank goodness you stuck with it because you're, you're, you're hilarious, but 90% of people are not going to get it. So, so, so it, who, if I could give you a free ticket to any comedian for tomorrow night, who would it be? Who do you want to see live? Dead or alive? Yeah, why not? Oh. <laughs> it might not be too funny, dead, but... Yeah. Uh, well. It's... Can I check my list? Yeah. Let me just have a look because I kind of update my list of favorite. Okay. Can I say, okay, I'm going to give two answers. Okay. Um, am I going to give two answers? Oh. Okay. My answer is, mm -hmm. I think it's become quite, uh, I think it's, I think it's become quite sort of, uh cool in comedy to hate on Stuart Lee because everyone had such a big phase of liking him a few years ago um I think my answer to this question is Stuart Lee if he was dead because I think once he's dead that's when people will really appreciate who he is he's become a bit less cool to like now but sometimes after people die people like someone like Patrice O'Neill people only really appreciated him properly yeah after he died I think my answer is Stuart Lee. If you once, once he's, he's once he's, he's died and achieved, you know, legend, legend, legend status. Okay. Okay. And you had another answer. My other answer would maybe be <laughs> Eric Rushton, my friend Eric. I don't know him. He's just, I'm he's, sure he's good. He's a good friend of mine. If I could snap my fingers and he has a whole new hour that I could go watch. I'd, yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Do, do you have any comedians that, this might sound like a weird question, who you don't find that funny, but you'd love to meet? So for example, um, I, like everyone's got a different sense of humour. I've never laughed at Ricky Gervais's stand-up, but if I could go for coffee with him for an hour, I would have the best hour because I loved The Office. I loved all the Carl Pilkinson stuff. And I love how hard he's worked to like build what he's got. Or, and the other one would be Trevor Noah. I don't actually find him that funny, but the social narrative he does throughout his comedy, I find just really lovely. Like, do you have any comedians like that? You don't actually find them that funny, but you respect them so much. Oh, comedians that I don't find funny, but I respect. That's difficult. I find, but I think my, my, my um, respect of a comedian might be quite, might be tied quite strongly to how funny I find them. Let me think. Which is fair. That's the that's the normal answer, I guess. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm I'm trying to. Which comedian do I not find funny, but would want to go for a coffee with? Let me think. I mean, I've got the thing is, there's so many people I would go for a coffee. Coffee with who would I? Oh, this is really tough. Yeah, you don't have to have an answer. Um. Maybe someone like, maybe someone who does podcasts and stuff, but it's just not for me in terms of their style. Maybe someone like Bill Burr. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I find him very, very interesting, but his style is maybe a little bit too abrasive for me. Um, I'm sure if I saw him live, I'd change my mind, but, um, and I've seen some of his older stuff that I really, really love. But yeah, maybe some, maybe yeah, someone like Bill Burr, I think he'd be fun to chat to, but is not necessarily my, yeah, my like dream, my favorite comedian at all. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, he seems to a lot of his um when I hear him talking long form, he just seems to be someone who kind of understands. He's very grounded and he understands what he wants to be in life. So 
people like that are always nice to chat to. Yeah, for sure. Do you have a podcast? I don't. I don't. I don't think I'd be good on uh, with, with a podcast, and it's a lot of work. I think I prefer making sketches because I'm a bit of a control freak, and I get to control every aspect of them. I mean, you have lots of. You say that almost all your friends are comedians, and and you have like connections outside of your friend group. I mean, it would be. Wouldn't that make it quite fun for like an hour a week to just be chatting with a comedian and having a laugh? I I think at, at one point, hopefully, I'll, I'll have a kind of long and fruitful career where I'll get to try everything. But at the moment, I'm just, I'd like to, anything where I can write. I, I enjoy the process of writing so much. I want to put all my time and effort into that. Um, so I like, I like to be able to produce little pieces of work. That's, the sketches are so creatively fulfilling, a, you know, a sketch or a script, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm working on a couple of scripts and that's that whole process of refining is nice. Whereas a podcast is like you get one go at it and then it's done. And the, and the control freak in me, it hates that because I'm like, oh, well, that could have been better. Well, I, I feel like I've done a couple of podcasts before and every time I've ended, I've gone, can we try that? Should we just do that again? Yeah. Like we're, Take we're, two. we're easing into it now. Yeah. Mm. And so you're writing scripts as in. Is, is that long form scripts for obviously for your stand up, but for anything else? Yeah, a couple of um, a couple of like TV scripts. I, w- I worked on something last year, which is like the most effort I've ever put into anything. Well, apart from my apart from my show, apart from OK Zuma, the most uh, at the same time as writing OK Zuma, I was writing a a sitcom pilot script and, and with just no experience of script writing or anything with a friend of mine. And Oh, it was a, it was a, you know, an arduous process, but I learned a lot from it. And then this year, um, having another go at it again with a different idea. And um, that's, yeah, it's fun. It, that that whole, the whole process of honing and refining is is really fun. And, and did you do that because you were asked to, or it was your own initiative to do it, hoping someone would pick it up? Well, people like, when people in TV, as soon as they see you doing stand up, they'll try and get you to do everything. Um, so, so you have meetings with people, and then they go, "Oh, you should write a script. Send us some ideas." And you wind up, you know, writing a script. And uh, you know, I mean, the chances of anything ever getting made is so so slim. You know, I'm not holding my breath, but um, yeah, you, you, it's fun. And if anything does get made, it's like, wow, that's you know a whole new range of skills come from that what's your favorite sitcom people well, peep show i have to say peep show it's the yeah. best one it's the best it's for sure it's the and favorite character in peep show you know i think when i started watching it it was it was mark but yeah. the more i rewatch it it's jazz really yeah yeah 100 yeah what what about johnson or big johnson's, johnson's great jo- johnson's great but Oh, Jez is, uh, you know, I think I, I saw myself a lot more as Mark when I was younger, but but um, I see myself becoming becoming Jez more and more. Yeah, with a creative lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just, yeah, it, it's, uh, he's so pathetic. I, yeah, he's, <laughs> they're both pathetic, but the way that Jez is pathetic is, I think he's more pathetic than Mark. Yeah, he's. Uh, if I had to date one, it would be a so obviously Mark, even though yeah. they're both horrible, because Jess would just be un- unbearable. Yeah, Jess is, yeah. A, is a dirt bag. I love it. I love shitty, like morally just bankrupt characters. What's your favorite episode of Peep Show? Oh, the wedding. It, the, the, yeah. What's the one? What's the one? No, sorry, not the wedding. What's the one where? Sophie's coming down the stairs and they're all going oh the happy birthday, birthday. that's yeah. the first episode of season four where yeah. they meet the parents yeah. yeah that is just oh the script is so tight every line is a joke it's so it's that's the one that they burn down the barn yeah Barney um, they yeah down Barney. he's got a bit of a head on it and I'm sure Mark will see to that it's <laughs> such a funny episode and Jez yeah sleeps with the mum it's yeah. Fantastic. I think season four of Peep Show, like every single episode is just, so it starts with the, meeting the parents and ends with a wedding. 
it's just such a good story arc. What's your opinions on, it's quite popular to say that Peep Show fell off in the later seasons, would you agree with that? Um, you know, I, I, I kind of love it too much to have noticed, maybe it had. I mean, there was that, 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 there's that terrible episode with, um, I think it might even be another wedding. What's the one where Dobby has that kind of hipster boyfriend character? Yeah, that's in season nine or yeah, yeah season great. nine, like episode two. Egg, the, it's the, called Gregory's Beard. That's yeah. it, yeah. The thing is, Peep Show feels very naughty. So I've always, there's something about it that, that that just feels so stuck in that time. And, and, and it was like weird when they kind of tried to update it with all this. He's like tracking her on Facebook or something, and and then there's like this hipster hipster character, and yeah, I just I don't know. That was a bit strange, but it didn't stop me enjoying it. Yeah, I liked season nine. I think part of it's we waited so long. Um, I liked yeah. uh, the story arc of uh, the guy that is basically Jordan Peterson. I've forgotten his name, but uh, April's new husband, and then like kidnapping him and stuff that was all good yeah Angus. that's it yeah. yeah 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 that is good peep show's good do you prefer us office or uk office I, they're not comparable people do this all the time but you can't you just can't compare them because there's so much more of the us office mm. like if you condensed all of the best parts of the us office into two series then the US office would be so much funnier. I, 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 you, I think you have to give it to. It's such a, it's such a feat of television to have made that much, and and for it to still be good and still be interesting. It has to be the US office. Yeah, fair enough. If, if we, not season eight and nine though, right? Um, yeah, they're not as good, but it's, it's still impressive. Still I mean, like yeah, it. they they had a good go at it. Yeah, yeah, you got to give them that for sure. So, do you have? What's like on your, I understand that you've definitely got your head screwed on, like you're appreciative of what you have and you're just going to see what happens. But like, what's your like three bucket lists in your career in life? Mm. Like what would it, what would it just be amazing as a comedian to, to achieve or, or meet someone to meet? I, um, someone, someone to meet is a good question. I'll do, maybe I'll just do, in terms, I, I'll do, in terms of career milestones, you know, it's so difficult because I'm not really the kind of person that sets themselves goals because then I'm worried that I won't achieve them. Mm. Um, I, I, I love play, doing big rooms mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm gradually just sort of working my way towards, I want to do, you know, get, do, do bigger, bigger and bigger rooms. Uh, and if, if, if that can be the general trajectory of my career, then I'm, I'm happy with that. Even if they're not my own shows, I just want to do big yeah. shows, big theatres. You know, I, I did, I did uh, the Brighton Centre um, opening for Mickey Flanagan. Um, and Dude, that's unreal. Yeah, it was 4,000 people and it was the biggest room I've ever done by far. And it was, it's just... Uh, that's unreal. And did Mickey contact you? We were the same agent. Okay, that's so cool. It was, oh, it was, yeah, it was, it was really excellent, and uh, and and it was just it, it, the laughs fall in different places in a room like that, and you can get away with so much more. Yeah. Than you can in a seventy seater, and um, the experience, it, you know, it, it's just, it's such a it's it's so thrilling to do that. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it will wear off, and I'll become numb to it at some point, but you know, I I, I um. If I could just keep doing that and keep watching my numbers and stuff on social media go up and um, and make hours that I'm really happy with, make hours where I'm like every single bit in this is tight and well written, um, you know, that's then, you know, that I'll just I'll keep being satisfied. I'll, I'll you know, I'll keep feeling kind of fulfilled. Um, Do you feel that way about OK Zoomer? You feel like that was the 40 minutes I'm I'm so proud of? At the time, yeah. At the time, I was very proud of it, but you, you know, I have to keep uh, pushing myself. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, at the time, it was only a few months ago. Or well, that's well, when I, it released. I, 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 the, I finished writing the show in twenty twenty two, 
so I've I've now almost got another full hour of of stuff, um, which I'm do I'm doing a little tour of around um, around the UK. I'm doing a couple of like work in progress shows, and then I've got my, the proper tour in October, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I, I um, your my, your standards always going to get higher after you've done a show. I hope I, I hope that I'll always look back on the show before and go, oh, that was crap. I can do so much better than that now. No, it, it was really good, and I thought was the was the nod at the uh, the sentimental nod, uh, which I thought was lovely. Was that there because your your parents were there and you kind of wanted to? I almost felt like you it was a gift to your parents at the end, or like a sort of thank you. The, the stuff about my the stuff about um like doing, like doing comedy as a kid and yeah, and being grateful for your childhood and who you were as a kid and stuff. It just it just kind of felt like you were say, sort of saying thank you for the progress so far. I, I, maybe I read it wrong. No, I guess I guess I guess it is that. Yeah, I mean, I had quite a idyllic uh, childhood. So, yeah, I guess I guess it it was. I mean, it's sort of it's sort of a more it's sort of a nod to childhood in general. I think. Um, I I I just enjoy. Uh, the unseriousness of childhood yeah um and when I wrote that show it was at a time when I felt like all of my friends were getting more serious and I was losing touch with them and and um and and and, and I and I, I was hanging around a lot with my younger cousin who is a few years younger than me and I was going to all his pies and I was like, oh, my God, I missed this. I don't want to, you know, comedy was scaring me. The, 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 the pressure of everything was scaring me. And I felt like I just wanted to go back to to school, to being 18, to being and then, you know, to being a kid, really, um, which everyone feels, you know, that first year out of uni, which is when I wrote the show you know, mm. immediately first year out of uni. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a nod, it's a nod to 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 childhood it's 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 just it's just being grateful for it's it's being grateful for the experience but also yeah it's just it's yeah i don't yeah I, maybe i've articulated that badly does that make sense what i'm saying yeah definitely yeah um i just so, like when it zoomed at the end was that your parents that zoomed in on or was it just random audience members? Mm. Oh yeah, just then my parents weren't there. It's just random audience members. So that's why I totally misread it. I thought the last shot was your parents. <laughs> oh no, yeah, no, they weren't there. I don't let them come <laughs> to my stuff. No. Oh, you should. Sure? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. Right. Well, that question seems ridiculous then. <laughs> no, but it, it makes it makes sense. I mean, I'm talking yeah. about being grateful for my yeah, be, you know, enjoying my child and stuff. If people watch it and think that those are my parents at the end, that adds an extra dimension to it, which is great. Yeah, maybe think about that for your next show, because that would have been great. <laughs> oh, yeah. If I can, I'll, I'll, I'll do another show about being young. I'll just keep doing shows about being young for the rest of my life. Hope no one notices. Yeah, easy. I mean, it works for a lot of comedians. Of course. Of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really appreciate your time. I, it, it's very kind of you to give me time. Um, I know that you're very busy. Um, and I... I know that you didn't have to do this, so thank you very much. So finally, the last question, what is what is your October tour going to be about and where are you going? Where can people see you? Um, it's, it's 12 cities. It's, it's um, oh, they're not all confirmed at the moment, but it will be the main, I'm not going to do any weird ones, really. It'll be the main, it'll be London, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, you know, Leicester, Edinburgh, Glasgow. It will be, it will be, it will be the main cities. A lot of student cities as well. I might do Guildford. I might do places with those big, uh, big unis, you know. Um, but the show is about, um, it's about being, it, 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 uh, being privileged and trying to prove to people that I'm not sheltered. Uh, you know, a kind of, it's about making efforts to try and be kind of a more cultured person. Uh, um, uh, it's called adventure well at the moment it's called adventures close to home uh mm. because it's about kind of getting 
you know, getting out and, and, and trying to meet different people, trying to become more worldly and knowledgeable about the about everything, but also sort of staying in my comfort zone for the, for the most part of my life. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a show about I talk about I talk about also I talk about private school a lot more. I talk about the fact that I've only ever been in relationships with um, girls from very strict religious families. Uh, and I talk about um, polar bears, Lord Sugar. Yep, all the classics. Uh, yeah, how I wish I was mentally ill. All, all <laughs> kinds of things. That that might be the one that gets you cancelled. Mm hmm Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm just, I, 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 hopefully some people can relate to that. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds brilliant. Well, I'll definitely be at one of your shows. I'll be one of the hecklers in Edinburgh that walks out. <laughs> Do it. I'll um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll wait until you um walk out and then do what I did the at the last show that happened and be like, oh fuck, if they stayed in, I would have, I would, I could have taken them all. I would have taken them all down. Fuck it, they're lucky yes. that they left. Yep. <laughs> yeah, fair play. That's uh, probably how I'd handle it. <laughs> well, it was lovely to talk to you, Finley. Thank you again. Lovely to talk to you too, Kate. Thank you for um, yeah, it was it was it was fun. Thanks for letting me chat. It was nice. Yeah, thanks. All the best. Likewise. Thanks so much. See ya.